We are now onto the second tier of the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg, but there are 11 tiers in total, so there is a ton more content to come. But without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is English breakfast tea, and join me as we explore the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg, 2007 Siberian Orange Snow. So this was an area of about 500 square miles in Siberia, where in 2007, they received an orange snowfall. It affected about 27,000 residents, was oily to the touch, and had about four times the normal level of iron. There were many theories about its origin, one of which being a massive sandstorm in the neighboring Kazakhstan, but we don't fully know what actually caused it. The abduction of Violet Ripken. So this was a strange abduction of a 74 year old lady, Violet Ripken, in 2012. She was the wife of a professional baseball player, Cal Ripken, and on the morning of July 24th at 7 a.m. she entered her garage to head out for breakfast when she was confronted by a man with a gun who had been waiting for her. He restrained her with tape and put her in the back seat of her own car. Then he started to drive. Violet lived alone and was quite independent, so for the next few hours nobody actually knew she was missing. The kidnapper kept telling Violet that he wasn't going to hurt her, and he kept to his word. He simply kept driving and stopping off at various places to buy things with Violet's credit card. Soon a massive search was started, but after driving around for 23 hours, Violet was found in the back of her car which had been abandoned just a block from Violet's home. She was perfectly fine except a little shaken and the kidnapper hadn't hurt her in any way or demanded a ransom. It seemed like he just wanted to do a bit of shopping. The man along with his motives has never been found and it's still a mystery how he was able to abandon the car so close to where Violet lived when by this point the area was absolutely swarming with police on the lookout for Violet and her car. Invisibility Cloak? Ada Constance Kent. This is a bit of a creepy one. So Ada Constance Kent was a wealthy lady who lived alone in a cottage in Essex, England. And in the summer of 1939, she vanished. The door to the cottage was found unlocked with the remains of a meal on the table and an open copy of Romeo and Juliet on a chair near the fireplace. The case then went completely cold until nine years later when there was a mysterious deposit into Ada's bank account. So the police went back to the cottage to search for new clues and they found a fully clothed skeleton next to the bed. Next to the skeleton was an empty bottle marked poison. They later determined that the skeleton found didn't even belong to Ada and that skeleton is yet to be identified. So there are possibly two dead women, one of which Ada has never been found and the other, the skeleton, has never been identified. As I said, pretty creepy one. Agent 355. This was a code name for a female spy in the American Revolutionary War. She was one of the first spies for the United States and was thought to have had a major hand in exposing Benedict Arnold as a traitor for the British. Her actual identity is unknown, but there have been a few theories about who she might have been. There are a few references to 355 in pop culture, and it's a fun little topic to read into if you like this sort of thing. Alexandra Palace's wartime television demonstrations. So after World War II started, the BBC television service suspended all of its broadcasting to the public from the Alexandra Palace in London. This was partly so that the German planes couldn't use the signals from the transmissions in order to help navigate around London and England. But over the next six years, two demonstrations would be recorded in Alexandra Palace in secret. Both of them were aired live, but whereas the 1945 one was highly documented, with singers, comedians, actors all participating, the 1943 show has no official record and only very minor pieces of evidence actually exist. There are photos that show BBC engineers and makeup artists filming in Alexandra Palace in 1943, but there's very little visual evidence of it and no documentation. So what exactly was being filmed there in 1943 is a complete mystery. The Alphabet Murders. This one is very sad. This was a string of murders of three girls aged 10 to 11 in the 1970s New York. They're called the Alphabet Murders because each girl killed had the same first and last initial and they were found in a nearby village or town with that same letter. So Carmen Colon was found in Churchville, her two initials and the location all starting with C. Wanda Velkovich was found in Webster and Michelle Mainzer was found in Macedon. Each girl was first abducted, then assaulted and then strangled to death. These were absolutely horrific crimes and the fact that people with this level of evil in them actually 
actually exist out there makes me both sad and angry sometimes. Anjing Ajak. This is a myth of a giant werewolf in Java, Indonesia. It is incredibly clever and deceptive and changes from its human form into its werewolf form in order to kill and eat people. The word Anjing actually means dog in Indonesian, so I guess this is more like a were dog. Doesn't seem so bad when you put it that way. Asia Degree. This was a really sad case of a nine-year-old girl who went missing in North Carolina 2000. For unknown reasons, she just packed her bag one morning and left her home. She was soon spotted walking along a highway in extremely heavy wind and rain, but when a motorist stopped and turned around to try and help her, she immediately ran off the road into a wooded area. This was the last anyone ever saw of Asia. Almost two years later, her bag, which was still fully packed, was found in a construction site nearby. It kind of looks like she was attempting to run away, but nine is normally a really young age to want to do that, and she seemed to have a pretty decent family life. For whatever reason, she seemingly left her home and neighborhood willingly, and was either killed, abducted, or is living her life somewhere out there to this day. The Atlas Vampire. This was the case of a 31-year-old prostitute named Lily Lindstrom, who was found dead in her apartment in Atlas, Stockholm. She had been dead for two or three days, and was found naked on her bed with her body completely drained of blood. There was a ladle found nearby, and police suspected that whoever had killed her had then drained all of her blood and then used the ladle to drink it. Even though this was all the way back in 1932, if it was a vampire, they might still be alive today. The attempted bombing of Richard Singer. In New Zealand, 1937, prominent criminal defense lawyer Richard Singer arrived home via taxi at around six in the evening. He left the taxi and walked through his front gate when there was suddenly a huge explosion with rock, metal, and flames flying everywhere. Richard was badly injured, but it's thought that the fact that he was swinging his arms as he walked through the gates meant that his right arm was up at the time of the explosion, and this likely saved his life. His arm took some of the more direct hits, which, had they not been blocked, might very well have killed him. No one, not even Singer himself, had any real clue who the attempted killer might have been, and analysis of the bomb was done, and suggested that the bomb wasn't timed or triggered, but rather manually lit and then thrown at Singer as he walked through the gate. But neither Singer nor the taxi driver saw anyone on the scene. Two weeks later, Singer received a letter saying there would be another attempt on his life. He was was convinced that this was a hoax and wasn't actually from the bomber. There was no further attacks, no one was charged for the crime, and this case still remains unsolved. Babes in the Woods This phrase references a children's tale of two children who are abandoned in a woods and later die and are covered up with leaves. There have been a few murder cases named after this tale, but one that I found was in 1953 Vancouver. The bodies were of two boys, and no one knew who they were or where they came from. Decades later, a woman called Ali Brady discovered a photograph of her grandmother when she was young, alongside two of her brothers, who she never knew existed. Her grandmother now had dementia, so in order to find out more about these brothers, allies' great uncles, she did a 23andMe DNA test. Eventually, through a few different channels, Ali's DNA was tested against DNA of the two boys, and it was a family match. These were the brothers of her grandma. This one is a bit unique, and also a bit sad, and no one to this day knows what happened to those boys, or who killed them. The Babushka Lady. This was an as of yet unidentified lady who was present during the JFK assassination. She was holding a camera and wearing a headscarf, similar to that worn by babushkas or old ladies in Russia. When the actual shooting starts, everyone around her is panicking and running around like mad, but she just stands still with the camera to her face, seemingly taking photographs or footage. She then crossed the street and joined the crowd on the grassy knoll, which is an area where nothing suspicious happened at all, so there is no reason for you to search for JFK assassination, grassy knoll. Her and the footage from her camera were never seen again or identified. Although there have been a few ladies that have come forward saying it was them, their legitimacy has been questioned over the years, and so officially she is still unidentified. The Baghdad Battery. This was the name of three artifacts that were found together in Iraq 1936, and some think they were 
used as some sort of rudimentary battery. This could have been used in some sort of electrotherapy or electroplating, which is a really cool method for plating one metal with another. It is composed of a clay jar with an asphalt stopper, a copper cylinder, and an iron rod. And when filled with an electrolytic solution like vinegar, produces about 1.1 volts. Strangely, this artifact went missing during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, leading some people to believe that they were covering up evidence of an advanced ancient civilization. This is a really cool artifact and topic that honestly shows just how ingenious some of these civilizations were. Becca. This was a strange case in New Mexico 1991 involving a motel room. The room was booked by Eduardo Collin, a local truck driver, and two days later when Eduardo had failed to check out, security went to his room, which was locked from the inside. They eventually made their way inside, and though they didn't find Eduardo, they found multiple bottles of alcohol and a dead woman hanging from the shower. There was a photograph of her with a man on the table, and when motel staff were shown this photo, they identified the man as Eduardo. So obviously they went in search of Eduardo, but after finally finding him, he wasn't alive either. He had apparently died from natural causes a few years back. When Eduardo's family was shown this photograph, they said the man in the photograph wasn't Eduardo and they had no idea who this woman was. In 2001, police received a tip saying this woman's name was Becca, but no more information was uncovered. It seems to me like whoever this man was, he was clearly not Eduardo, but had simply used Eduardo's name and details to book the room. But whatever else, happened that night and who Becca actually was remains unknown. This is a bit of a long one, so I hope you enjoy this semi-deep dive. Belle Gunness. This was a Norwegian-American serial killer who killed at least 14 victims in Illinois and Indiana between 1884 and 1908. Her main motive seemed to be money and the list of insurance payouts this woman had is insane. In 1884, Belle married Mads Sorensen. They owned a candy store together, which later burned down. Then, their home burnt down. And, of course, both of these were heavily insured. Then, two babies in Belle's home died from inflammation of the large intestine, a possible symptom of poisoning. She never appeared to be pregnant, and neighbours often gossiped about whether these were actually her children or not. But, of course, she had life insurance policies on both of them, and so collected a large sum after their deaths. Then, her husband, Sorensen, had, on July 30th, 1900, two overlapping life insurance policies. One was expiring the next day and one went into effect on that day. So, of course, he died of a brain hemorrhage that exact day. Bell then collected both insurance payouts and bought a pig farm in Indiana. Two years later, she married Peter Gunness and a week after that, Peter's infant daughter died of unknown causes while in Bell's care. Eight months after that, Peter died of a skull injury. After, as Bell explained it, he reached for something on a high shelf and a meat grinder fell on him. This is like Looney Tunes. The coroner suspected murder, but it didn't go any further than that. And of course, she collected a large insurance payout. Over the next few years, she basically lured guy after guy to her home on the pig farm through adverts for marriage in local papers. These guys would never be seen again and would sometimes take out large sums of cash just before they went missing. Belle would actually go on to keep stuff of theirs, like expensive coats and luggage trunks, saying that the guys had come to stay but then just left without telling her. Yeah, very likely. A carpenter that was doing work on Bell's farm noted that there was more than a dozen luggage trunks in Bell's home, likely from the guys that she had killed. In 1908, Bell's farm burnt down and the bodies of Bell and her three children were found in the fire. Except, Bell's head had no body, which isn't a common injury caused by a fire, but with the technology available at the time, it was a little hard at first to determine whether this was or wasn't Bell. On the grounds of the farm, police found burlap sacks found with dozens of legs, arms, torsos, and heads. Before the fire, one of the brothers of one of the victims told Bell that he would be visiting the farm very shortly to find his brother, which is thought to have pushed Bell to burn down her farm and fake her death. And despite the coroner declaring 
declaring that the body found was five inches shorter than Bell. She was declared dead and was never seen again. Beowulf. This is a really cool, very long poem and is one of the oldest surviving English language stories. It tells the story of a young warrior coming to the aid of the King of Danes to protect his kingdom from a monster called Grendel. He kills Grendel, then kills Grendel's mother, then returns to the kingdom with treasures and one hell of a story. He is later crowned king and holds the peace for 50 years until a dragon then threatens the land. Beowulf eventually slays the dragon but dies soon after. It's a pretty cool archetypal story thought to be written in the 8th to 11th century but it's suspected that it was originally passed down from generation to generation with only the spoken word meaning no one really knows how far back the story of Beowulf actually goes. Beowulf is a cool name though, Bermea. This is a phantom island found, or rather not found, off the coast of Mexico. Phantom islands are islands that appear in maps, often older maps, but that later can't be located. Bermea appeared in several maps from the 16th to 20th century, but in recent surveys and searches, it's as if it never existed. Could it have sunk due to shifts on the ocean floor, rising sea levels? Did it ever actually exist at all, or as some people think, did the CIA destroy the island in order to expand their rights to that area of the ocean? The CIA are pretty sneaky and murderous, so I wouldn't put murdering an island past them. Bigfoot. This creature goes by many names, such as Skunk Ape, Almus, Yeren, Yeti, Yowie, Sasquatch, but all depict the same creature. A large, muscular, dark-haired, bipedal ape. Bipedal. Bipedal ape. Picture a gorilla but walking upright. This one has a huge following in some communities and there are so many theories and debates about whether it's all a hoax, whether it's a result of government DNA splicing, an ancient species that has lived in hiding away from the humans, or one of my favorites, an alien species that seeded life onto earth. This species later lost its ship and as humans continued to multiply and evolve, these aliens were forced into seclusion and hiding, eventually devolving slightly due to their environment and lack of technology. This, some people say, is why apes were chosen to receive this intelligence, because we are essentially offsprings or mutations of this Bigfoot species. As you can tell from just this small segment, there are tons of wild theories out there, and it's kind of refreshing going through all the craziest ones and imagining all the different possible scenarios. But I think this one will remain with us for a long time. The brain in a vat. So I won't go into this one as we have done very similar ones like the Boltzmann brain and the simulation hypothesis in previous videos, but think The Matrix. It basically says that you are a brain in a vat and that this entire universe doesn't exist and is all just a result of electrodes stimulating this brain. Uh, it's a pretty creepy one. The Butcher of Mons. This was a serial killer in 1996 and 7 in Mons, Belgium. Police found the dismembered bodies of five women in 12 separate plastic bags found on roadsides and embankments. All the victims were of a somewhat poor background and they all frequented the area of the Mons railway station. The killer was never found and to this day remains unknown. Camera heads. This was a reference to an early creepypasta before they were even popular, posted on 4chan in 2009. The post reads, What's a camera head? I was walking home through a nearby gully and came across a weird stack of rocks and a torn envelope with some writing on it. It appeared to have been written in charcoal or ash. It said, I killed a camera head. What's a camera head? On the next line, it took Trevor. And the last line, get help if I don't come back. And there was a mini DV nearby. This was all that was on it besides static, though I had to watch it a few times before I found this clip. Who took this video? A camera head sounds really silly if it's a monster with a camera for a head. The user attached a link to a YouTube video that he had uploaded, which contained the contents of the cassette that he had found. After this post and this YouTube upload, he is never seen from or heard from again. The video itself contains mostly static, but depicts the person or thing taking the footage, creeping up on these two boys, and then chasing and attacking them. If these camera heads exist, the video seems to be its memory that was taken 
from the camera head after it had been killed. Pretty creepy stuff. To add to all of this, the actual story and the post were lost for quite some time, until a deep search and investigation done by several forum members years later rediscovered the whole thing. Cannibal Holocaust Piranha Scene. So I won't show any photos of this one as it is truly horrific, but Cannibal Holocaust was a horribly brutal, bloody and taboo film released in the 1980s depicting four protagonists going into the Amazon rainforest to study a cannibalistic tribe. It's honestly some truly horrible stuff, but one scene in particular was extra horrible and somewhat suspicious. This scene involved a member of this tribe being tied to a log by the other members. He was then lowered into a body of water infested with piranhas and when they pulled him up his entire lower leg had been eaten to the bone. However, this scene was never in the film, with only a single still shot being in some promotional footage. Director Ruggiero Diodato said he didn't film the entire scene, but simply took a single still shot for publicity. But some people have said they were actually there when the scene was being filmed, so who's lying? On top of this, some people have questions regarding how realistic the scene actually looked, leading some people to believe that the scene was actually real and filmed with a real tribesman really having his leg eaten. But after realizing how real it looked, the director decided to delete all evidence of it and to not include the film in the scene. Celebrity number six. This was a Reddit post in which the user asked a question about their curtains. It was a set of curtains with illustrations of celebrities over the last 10 to 15 years. Slowly, they were all identified except for one celebrity, simply known as number six. There were many, many suggestions about who the celebrity might be but none of them really fit the image perfectly, so this one is still unanswered. Charles Peck's phone calls. This was a strange case where 49-year-old Charles Peck was involved in the tragic Chatsworth train crash. He died instantly, but his phone made 35 calls after his death to his son, sister, brother, stepmother, and fiance. When they answered the calls, all they heard was static, and after the phone calls stopped, Charles was found just an hour later underneath the rubble. The coroners determined that he he had died instantly and so wasn't alive when these phone calls were made, but maybe he was trying to contact his family from the other side. The Chicago Tylenol Murders. These were a series of poisoning deaths in 1982 Chicago. The victims had all consumed Tylenol branded capsules, which had been unknowingly laced with potassium cyanide. The seven victims all died shortly afterwards. It is generally thought that the culprit took some pill bottles off the shelf and added the poison to some of the capsules. These deaths prompted one of the largest pharmaceutical recalls ever, and a push to strengthen anti-tampering laws and packaging. Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturers of Tylenol, recalled over 31 million bottles and stated that they would exchange any bottles of Tylenol capsules with solid Tylenol tablets. The killer was never identified or caught, and to this day it remains a mystery. The Cleveland Torso Murder, also known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, which personally I think sounds a little bit cooler. I am not endorsing murder, I'm just saying it sounds cool. He was a serial killer active in the 1930s Ohio. He killed at least 13 victims, possibly up to around 20, most of whom were from the area known as Hobo Jungle. This area was known for its gambling, prostitution and drinking, and all the bodies were disposed of in the neighborhood of Kingsbury Run. All of the victims were beheaded, and most were dismembered in some way, with the males often being castrated. Bodies were often found up to a year after they had been dumped, and as with a lot of these unsolved cases, sadly, the killer was never found. The Connecticut River Valley Killer. This was an unidentified serial killer, Ooh, there's a lot of these, who killed at least seven victims in New Hampshire in the 1980s. The remains of two women were found in 1985 and 6, leading police to investigate other murders and missing peoples in the area. They eventually found two previous cases, one in 1978 and one in 1981, that shared similarities to these killings. The killings were mainly done with a knife, with a a few of the victims having their throats slit. There were a few sketches done of potential suspects, but the investigators never really got further than that. The contents of the Library of Alexandria. So if you like history, this one is fantastic. The Great Library of Alexandria was one of the largest and well-stocked libraries in the ancient world. Before the days of the internet, I know, hard to imagine, libraries were immensely important. If you or someone in your local village didn't know a thing, that was it. 
it, you had no real way of getting other knowledge, unless you visited a library. Just imagine 2300 years ago, these huge chambers and rooms filled with vast amounts of books and scrolls and chronicles, detailing and documenting everything from ancient stories to historical accounts to medical and engineering notes and techniques. I mean, it's basically like the internet, but worse. But for those days, it was incredible. It contains an estimated 400,000 scrolls at its height, and Alexandria soon became known as the capital of knowledge and learning. Many, many great and ancient philosophers, doctors, poets, scholars, either moved to or worked in Alexandria, simply to have access to all of this knowledge. And despite many people's beliefs that the library of Alexandria was burnt down in a great fire, it likely just slowly declined, as during the reign of Ptolemy VIII Fiscan, intellectuals were purged from Alexandria and never really went back in the numbers that they had before. Julius Caesar accidentally burned part of it during his civil war, but it was likely quickly repaired and over the period of Roman rule just slowly continued to decline in popularity and membership. But with all of the contents that were removed, burnt or stolen, we don't even know half of the stuff that was housed in this library or what ancient secrets or knowledge it held. Corpse quakes. This is a mental affliction that has been found to affect gravediggers. One story tells of a gravedigger in the 1900s who, one day while on his job, suddenly became quiet and started to shake. The other gravediggers in the cemetery started to make fun of him until they realized that he was serious. They suggested that he should just go home but he insisted on staying and digging the graves. As he was digging, he was shaking constantly. A few days later, these other workers had the corpse quake too, and a week later, they all stopped work entirely. He couldn't do his job as he was constantly affected by this every time he went to dig. And after being home for more than a week, he seemed to be getting his spirits back until his son randomly said the word spade. Just seems like his son hated him. And he suddenly went back to being quiet and shaking. Eventually, the man became sick and died and the other two men eventually moved away. So they never found out what caused it. Cosmic string. So this is a complex topic to fully explore and understand, but imagine the early universe as water in an ice cube tray. Now imagine when the big bang happens that the ice cube tray is immediately flash frozen. Often you would find cracks in this ice due to the rapid change of state. So this is essentially what cosmic strings are. They are a theorized crack, if you will, in space, caused by the immense heat and energy during the Big Bang. These are theoretical, extremely thin or one-dimensional, and have an incredible mass relative to their size. It is thought that these cosmic strings may have caused early galaxies and solar systems to clump together and form. This topic is very advanced and goes way into the depths of quantum physics and astrophysics. But as always, if you want to learn more, check it out. Dale Williams. So this is a semi-long one, but I felt like I needed to explore it a bit more in order to do it justice. In 1999, a family was swimming in the waters of the San Miguel and Dolores rivers. While swimming, they spotted a white pickup truck underneath the water. They called the authorities who quickly linked this truck to a man who had gone missing six weeks earlier, Dale Williams. However, when they searched the truck, they found no sign of Dale. Six weeks earlier, Dale was reported missing by his wife. He hadn't come home one night, and the next morning she drove down to his auto shop and found no sign of Dale. She found a car with its bonnet still open and tools on the side with the front door unlocked, almost like he was working on a car and then stepped away for just a few moments. Very strange. It was later confirmed that Dale had been to see a local member of his church, and while he was there, received a phone call from an anonymous woman claiming to require roadside assistance and being an auto repair shop, Dale didn't actually do roadside assistance, but he was always willing to help out people in need. After this, he left to go help this woman with her car, and that was the last anyone ever saw of him. It was later determined that Dale's car didn't accidentally go into the river, as there was no skid marks, but that the truck was slowly pushed and steered into the river. The family put up missing posters over the next few weeks, but found that just a few days later, the posters were torn down, so they put them up again, and again they were removed. 
So police put up CCTV camera next to one of the posters. They found that the culprit was a local man and former friend of Dale and his wife. 12 months earlier, Dale had helped this man's ex-wife move to another state without telling him. This obviously angered him and a month after this incident, Dale kept finding strange things outside of his auto repair shop. Like torn up photographs that were actually stolen from inside his repair shop and several 22 caliber bullets and a 22 caliber revolver that were both stolen from inside the repair shop. This man was obviously questioned about Dale's disappearance but had somewhat of a solid alibi for that day. But to add to all that, the lady who called Dale for the roadside assistance has never come forward nor has she been identified and the call was made from a stolen phone. So it's likely in my opinion that this anonymous lady set some sort of a trap for Dale but whether she acted alone or what eventually became of Dale is still a mystery. Darwin Scott. This was actually the uncle of famous cult leader and murderer Charles Manson. He was found dead, stabbed 19 times and pinned to the floor with a butcher knife in 1969. His killer is still unknown and with Darwin Scott having a long rap sheet, being in and out of prison multiple times over the years, it was always hotly debated whether this was the work of his nephew, who was clearly capable of it, or of his criminal lifestyle catching up to him. David Chase. This one is kind of spooky. On October the 15th, 1995, Phil Harris, a private investigator, apparently heard a voice in his sleep. This voice said, I'm David Chase. I was murdered. I want you to investigate my murder. Go buy the Sunday paper. Phil woke up and was in disbelief. David Chase had died four months earlier. He was found having drowned in a nearby river and Judy, his wife, had always suspected that he was murdered. Phil then met with Judy and he apparently had knowledge of David and Judy's relationship that was super personal and that no one else knew besides David and Judy. This convinced Judy that David David was in fact contacting them from the other side. David had apparently said that he was going off for a swim with a raft in the river. Most of his clothes were seemingly ripped off and he had suspicious cuts on his legs. His wife was convinced that his clothes were actually cut off to remove some evidence and that the cuts were from the knife used to cut off the clothes. Phil apparently said that David had been speaking to him on a regular basis and told him of the entire plot. David had met up with a colleague at a bar for a drink. He detailed how he died, how David and this man had got into a fight, how his clothes were removed, the surrounding scenery, and the fact that there was a witness at the scene. This, of course, isn't evidence that would hold up in a court of law, and I call ghost to the stand. And soon after, Phil died of a heart attack, essentially freezing the case and leaving it up in the air. No one has been arrested for David's death, and we don't know if Phil was just a bit loopy, or if David really was contacting him from beyond the grave. David Fortin was a 14-year-old boy who went missing in Quebec 2009. Around 9am on February 10th, David left on foot to the bus stop that would eventually take him to school, but that was the last anyone ever saw of him. His mother suggested he might have run away as he was being bullied in school, but there's no evidence for his running away or his abduction. He seemingly just vanished without a trace. Diane Suzuki. This was a 19-year-old student in the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She disappeared on July 6th, 1985. This case was one of the most notorious criminal cases in Hawaii and was the first time the Honolulu Police Department used advanced for the time technologies like Luminol. The case eventually went cold and her killer was never found. The Doodler. This was an unidentified serial killer believed to have been responsible for between 6 and 16 deaths in 1974 and 5 San Francisco. The killer was a young 6 foot black man of slender build who would meet his victims at gay bars and clubs and would sketch his victims before stabbing them to death. There was an unidentified man who was questioned by the police and they considered charging him as they were fairly sure that he was guilty. But the three surviving victims didn't want to appear in court in order to testify against him. They wanted to keep their identities unknown, likely out of fear, but we don't know the name of the suspect or the survivors. And very little is actually known about this case publicly. But the likely suspect for these crimes did walk free and was never charged. Doomsday Stonehenge. This one is 
pretty strange? These were a set of slabs that appeared in Albert County, Georgia. They were found in 1979 and are set up like a Stonehenge of sorts. Carved onto them are 10 guidelines or rules in eight modern languages and four dead languages. No one knows who carved them or put them there, but the guidelines read as follows. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature. Theories about these stones range from a new world order, calling for the culling of humanity down to 500 million, to them being of satanic or extraterrestrial origin. The Drake and Josh pilot. This was the lost and partially found original pilot of Drake and Josh. This was filmed before the series was greenlit by Nickelodeon, and some of the events in the episode were written slightly differently to how they came out in the later pilot. The lost pilot had Stephen First playing the dad, instead of the later Jonathan Goldstein, and since we only have the partial footage released, we don't fully know what the other differences might be. Der Eisener Man, or the Iron Man. This is an old iron pillar partially buried in the ground. It is located in a German forest near Dunsterkopf. The pillar stands just over one meter high and goes about a meter into the ground. It is a popular meeting place for people to just stand around and drink coffee next to, and it was first mentioned in the 17th century as being a dividing point between two areas, but it was thought to have been created sometime in the 1400s, though no reference to it from that age exists. It was originally placed somewhere else, but was moved to its current location in 1727. L. Fausto. This was a strange one. On July 21st, 1968, L. Fausto, a 14 meter cargo boat, and her crew, three men from the Hernandez family, left from El Hierro to La Palma, two Canary Islands in the Atlantic. Just before they left, they took on board Julio Garcia Pino, who asked if he could get a lift to see his sick daughter in La Palma. So the crew obliged and at 2.30 a.m. set out on their 61 mile journey. When they failed to arrive at their estimated time of 10 a.m., the owner of El Fausto sent out an emergency message that the boat was missing. Four days later, a British ship traveling from South America to the Netherlands found them in the Atlantic, 108 miles from La Palma. They reported that the crew was well, and they accepted food, fuel, and cigarettes, but they refused the British ship's offer to tow them to a nearby island, which is a bit odd, but one theory suggests that the British ship wasn't entirely honest with their account, and maybe knew more than they were letting on. So, given this new information, a new arrival time was set, and once again, they failed to make it. So, a new search was started, and once again, no Nobody could find this boat. It was declared missing for a second time. Two months later, on October 9th, an Italian ship reported finding El Fausto in the middle of the ocean more than 620 miles from La Palma. When they boarded the ship, they found a dead man who was partly mummified. This was Julio. And there was no trace of the other men. There was no evidence of violence or damage on board. And Julio had actually kept a diary, which the first mate actually handed over to Spanish authorities, but only received back a page or two from the diary. The crew attached a cable to the boat to tow it to Venezuela, but that night the boat suddenly sunk, snapping the tow cable. Now there is a bunch of detail in this case. Firstly, the tow cable snapping, which takes a considerable amount of force, and theories for this range from it being sunk by a submarine in order to hide some evidence, or an attack by a large sea creature. To add to this, the entries into the journal that we do know of, ended with Julio writing, don't ever tell our son what happened to me. You know that God wanted this fate for me. I love you. But we have no idea what he wrote in the rest of the journal. Some context for all of this is that at the time, Spain was under a fascist dictatorship, wasn't aligned with NATO or the Warsaw Pact, and the Canary
Canary Islands were a poor region that often housed prisoners. Did the men aboard El Fausto genuinely go off course, resulting in them seeing something they shouldn't have seen? Were the crew of the British ship being fully truthful about their encounter with El Fausto? And what was written in the rest of Julio's journal? These are all very good questions with sadly very limited answers. The El Tanin Antenna. This was an object taken in a deep sea photograph in 1964 Antarctica. As you can see, the object is standing upright and looks very solid and straight, not what you'd usually expect from something in nature, especially this deep underwater. This has led some people to think that it is either alien technology or advanced ancient technology from a lost civilization. Some people have suggested that it is actually this, a type of carnivorous sponge, but I don't buy it. It was definitely aliens. Entombed animals. These are stories of animals, mostly frogs and toads, being found in entombed stuff like stone or concrete, and being alive after being trapped in there for huge periods of time. These reports go back a long time all over the world, and the idea of freeing a frog from its tomb got weaved into some stories and tales. But supposedly this was debunked in 1820, when an English geologist encased several toads in limestone and buried them in his garden, because that's something that normal people do. A year later he found that most of them were dead, but some were alive. So what does he do next? Obviously he buries them for another year. And unsurprisingly this time they were all dead. I think this guy just likes murdering frogs. Existence of aliens. Now this, more than any time I've said this, is one that I could definitely make hour long videos on. The evidence is so plentiful and wide and varied, and we've actually gone over a bunch of them in previous videos in this iceberg, including logical arguments for aliens like the Fermi paradox, to physical evidence such as crafts and tools, to potential sightings. I think this would be a really fun one to either do a live stream on or a deep dive video and just explore it a little bit. One of my theories is that life was seeded here by aliens and that they now live in colonies deep underneath the ocean. They mostly just observe us but occasionally do come up to interact with us. And that is my theory. Do, 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 do. And that is all we have time for. The support for these videos has been phenomenal and I really do appreciate every tiny bit of love and support that you guys have shown. The second part of tier 2 will be coming very soon so do leave a like if you liked the video hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss out on any later parts of this bizarre iceberg and as always guys thanks for watching